Hi everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about special senses, the ear, in particular the physiology of hearing. If you haven't watched the video on special senses, the ear, structures of the ear, please go back and watch that and then come back here. So last time we discussed what was going on with the structures in the ear and we discussed about the outer ear, middle ear, and inner ear. The outer ear's function is to funnel sound waves in to the middle ear. The middle ear's function is to transmit those sound waves into mechanical energy and transfer them to the inner ear. And the structure of hearing is the cochlea. And you can see it's got this sort of snail-like swirl thing going on. So the sound waves come in as, a, as oscillations in sound waves. They're going to come in and they're going to cause vibration of the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane is going to push against the malleus, cause the malleus to vibrate. The malleus is going to hit against the incus, it's going to cause the incus to vibrate, and that's going to cause the stapes to vibrate. The cochlea itself is made up of bone, so this outer swirly part is bone. And if you can imagine, I have a piece of plastic here that I'm trying to trying to swirl up like the cochlea, it kind of forms this sort of structure. So it's made from one tube that goes round and round and round and round. And this again is where the hearing receptors are housed. And in hearing, the type of receptors that we're using for this special sense are going to be mechanoreceptors. And if you can remember, mechanoreceptors are receptors that get activated by moving or bending, stretching or pulling. So we're going to see how that works. So what we're going to look at is what's actually going on inside the cochlea. If you were to take that bony swirl and you were to cut it and look inside it the long way, this way, you would actually see an outside area of bone and then inside are a few membranes that subdivide the tube into a couple of different chambers. So let's take a closer look at that. You can see that here. Here's the outside bony part, which is the outside of the tube. And then you can see the membranes that divide the inside of the tube into a couple of different chambers. And each of these chambers is filled with different types of fluid. The first chamber is up here, and this is called the vestibular canal. In your textbook, it's called the scala vestibuli. It is mirrored by one on the bottom called the tympanic canal. In your textbook, it's called the scala tympani. And in between the two of them is something called the cochlear canal. Your textbook calls it the cochlear duct. That one's a little bit easier to remember because it has the word cochlea in it. Now, do you remember on this piece of paper how I said the stapes sits on the oval window? So we're going to draw that in. Here's the oval window and here's the stapes sitting right on top of it. And again, the stapes is connected to the incus, which is connected to the malleus, which is right up next to the tympanic membrane. So the mechanical movement is coming this direction from the tympanic membrane through these bones and causing the stapes to push on this oval window in the vestibular canal. So we have our three chambers and separating them are these membranes. This one right here is called the basilar membrane. Sitting on top of the basilar membrane, you can see there's a box around it, is called the spiral organ. And I'm going to write that in big green letters because that is actually the part of this whole apparatus 
that is going to be sending the action potentials, receiving the information and sending the action potentials. Okay, so we have fluid, we have three chambers, we have bone around it, and we have some membranes in between the three chambers. So how this works is the tympanic membrane vibrates, it pushes against the malleus, incus, and stapes, and the stapes hits against the oval window. And remember, this chamber, the vestibular canal, is filled with fluid. And so when the stapes pushes on it, it's like pushing down on a waterbed. It causes waves in the fluid inside the vestibular canal. That Those waves are going to make this membrane move up and down. And that will transmit that wave energy from the vestibular canal into the cochlear canal. More waves will happen in the cochlear canal. And therefore, the basilar membrane will also vibrate up and down. So the basilar membrane is vibrating up and down. Let's take a closer look at what this looks like. Here's the spiral organ. And right here in blue, you can see the basilar membrane. Because of all the waves in the fluor, the basilar membrane is actually moving up and down. There's another membrane in here, right here. This is called the tectorial membrane. Sometimes people call it the tectorial plate because the one thing it doesn't do is it doesn't move. So the tectorial plate is pretty solid and the basilar membrane is moving up and down in relation to it. And sitting on the basilar membrane are these hairs. And you can see that they've got these little teeny hairs coming off of them. And that makes sense because these are actually called hair cells. Sometimes people will call them stereocilia. So these cilia are sticking up, attached to the spiral organ that's sitting on the basilar membrane. And as the basilar membrane moves up and down, the tectorial membrane does not. So it's almost, you can almost sort of imagine this. I'm gonna use a toothbrush to make my point. Here is the basilar membrane. Here are the hair cells. And the hair cells are gonna move up and they're going to hit that tectorial membrane. And when they hit the tectorial membrane, they're gonna bend. See how they're bending a little bit? And when they bend, because they are mechanoreceptors, they're going to become activated and they're going to cause an action potential to be sent. And you can see the nerve right here. These are all neurons and the hair cells are going to cause the beginning and the activation of an action potential and that action potential is gonna come down here on the cochlear nerve. It will be sent into the auditory complex of the brain, which is in the temporal lobe. Once these signals reach the brain, we will integrate the signals and we will know that we have heard something. So again, it's the mechanoreceptors here on the hair cells that are going to be activated and send an action potential all the way into the brain from the spiral organ. Now there's two different things that we hear when we're hearing. The first one is going to be amplitude. So amplitude basically means how loud something is. So you can imagine how this works as, I'm going to come back to this one for a second. As you hear something, if it's quiet, you can imagine, sorry, yeah, if it's quiet, you can imagine that there's not a lot of vibration of the tympanic membrane, not a lot of vibration of the bones, and there's not that many waves met. And so when the basilar membrane moves, it just moves a little bit. And you just get a little bit of activation of those hair cells. But the thing is really, really, really loud. You can imagine that those big, loud sound waves are causing a lot of motion to the tympanic membrane, which gets transferred all the way in and creates much more waves. It's 
like a tsunami in there. And that's going to cause the basilar membrane to really move up and down and bang into the tectorial membrane really hard. The problem with loud noises is that these hair cells are really de delicate. Imagine these being the hair cells. And if they're bending and slamming into the tectorial membrane really hard, you can imagine that they would eventually break. So people that have hearing loss sometimes have it because they listened to things that were too loud for too long. And they literally broke their receptors. They broke those hair cells. The other thing, the other difference we can hear when we're listening is we can hear pitch. And pitch has to do with frequency. So something with a low frequency would be down like this, and something with a high frequency would be up like this. And we can differentiate it because of the fact that the cochlea is that spiral, that spiral. So at the very beginning of the cochlea is going to be the oval window. And the waves are going to start, sorry, this is hard to do. Uh, the waves are going to start at the very beginning of the curve. And they're going to travel down through here to a certain point. And at that point, they're gonna lose enough energy to move through the spiral organ we will be able to sense that as a certain pitch. The lower the pitch, the further the waves travel towards the end of the tube before they cross over. Higher pitched sounds have a higher frequency and they lose their energy a lot faster and they're gonna cross over more towards the top of the tube. So depending on how far down the tube the spiral organ is activated, we can determine whether the pitch was high, medium, or low. Now how do you get rid of all those waves? How do you hear something and then not have to hear it again for the rest of your life? That has to do with this tympanic canal. So the tympanic canal receives all those waves from the basilar membrane. And the tympanic canal is able to absorb those waves and get rid of them by a structure called the round window. And the round window kind of works like a, a pitcher's mitt. So imagine if you have a mitt and something's coming at it with a lot of force, you don't hold it like this, you kind of move backward, you absorb that force. And that's how the round window works. When the waves hit the round window, they, the round window bulges out and helps to uh, mitigate the energy of those waves. So you don't keep on having all the waves in the ear. That's it for physiology of the ear. Come back again for the next video.